Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man on the first Friday of February. The F -F -F, first Friday of February, yes, that's right. And we're glad to have a great guest here that works with me all the time, day in, day out, on hydrogen. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about the exciting world of hydrogen as it's going around the world. We, we get exposed to people working hydrogen projects in Europe and on the mainland and here in Hawaii. And there's definitely something different in the air that we're going to talk about a little bit. So thanks for joining us here on Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, my guest today is Mitch, Mr. Mitch Hewitt from the University of Hawaii's Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Mitch, sure. thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Stan. Yeah, again. Again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we do a lot of stuff together. A lot of times we don't talk together very much for a couple weeks at a time, but we always tend to touch bases and, and get caught up. So give, give the audience again a little bit of your background and how you got into working with H&E yeah. and hydrogen. Okay, yeah, happy to do that. Um, it's, I, th I think it's interesting. So when I left the Navy after helping win the Cold War many years ago, I obviously wondered, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And uh, this is in the uh, mid-'80s. And uh, I said, well, the next big problem in the world is um, energy, clean energy. And I happened to be uh, officing with a company that represented a hydrogen fuel cell company called uh, Ballard. Mm -hmm. And so I went out to Ballard, and this is what got me. So they had this uh, workshop, and on the workshop bench, just like this table we're at, they had a fuel cell. And the only things that were plugged into it was hydrogen and oxygen, but they had like 15 aircraft landing lights, like 100,000 candle power lights on the ceiling. And they just hit a button and these things just exploded in light and heat and not a sound. And I went, wow. Cool. <laughs> and I said, I want to be part of this. And so that was, made that my mission. And from there I went to Florida, <clears throat> worked with a company down there and we built the world's first uh, fuel cell PEM fuel cell powered car. I don't want to complicate it, but the, the type of fuel cell they use today in cars, we built the first one. It was a racing car, advanced composite. The whole body weighed 240 pounds. Wow. And we, and we built the fuel cells from the ground up to operate on air, because all the fuel cells in those days operated on oxygen. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got started. And then uh, oh, about 15 years ago, the phone rang, and somebody asked me, what did I think about working in the tropics? And I was invited to come here to HNEI and uh, have an interview. And uh, Rick Rochelow, the director, uh, hired me as a consultant originally. <laughs> So I had to uh, work for my uh, job, and uh, we were lucky enough to win a proposal that we uh, wrote. And that project that we started 15 years ago is still going on. Great. That's yeah. terrific. Yeah. Hey, when, when you were on submarines, because you did that in the Navy, did they use electrolyzers to make their oxygen on board? Um, Nuclear submarines do because they stay submerged uh, with no interface with the surf for a long time, yeah. whereas I was on a diesel electric submarines. So, came up. so we had to come up every day or so and you know change out the air. Mm -hmm. So no, we did not have electrolyzers. Okay. But we did make hydrogen because we had big lead acid batteries and at some point they gas giving off hydrogen. Oh, uh, okay. And so we had to ventilate. We had that too. Yeah, we had to ventilate okay. that. We never used the hydrogen okay. as a fuel. Yeah, because yeah, I found it was really interesting. Last September, we were at uh, a conference with the PACOM folks and their science and technology guys were up there. I don't know if you were at the conference, but the special ops guy got up there and said, the problem is we can't take batteries, lithium batteries on the submarine. They're not clear to go on the submarine. Right. And I'm thinking, but on the submarine, you got electrolyzers that can make hydrogen and you got little metal hydride storage containers that can store the hydrogen safely on an airplane or a submarine. Right. They should just switch to that technology. So I, I, I told them about it, and they hadn't heard about that stuff before. Yeah. So again, this is the kind of technology starting to really, really spread now, and, and people are getting the idea that this may be pretty cool. Yeah. Same epiphany you had when you saw the thing on the table and all the aircraft lights went off. Yeah. I had a similar situation. I went to a conference, and these guys had a, a box. It was about the size of uh, um, a small engine 
um, and they had a computer and, and a bunch of lights running, and, and I'm looking, and they, that box wasn't plugged into anything, yeah. and that was a fuel cell. They were running the, all their stuff off a of fuel cell, and they told me about it, and I was just blown away. It's like quiet, and not much heat, and made all this electricity. The and biggest advantage is uh, it, when it, after it makes this electricity, I mean, it turns the hydrogen and oxygen into, into water, water again. again. Yeah. So it's a perfect cycle. Yeah. And that's why they call it, you know, some people call it the forever fuel. Yeah. Because we'll never run out of hydrogen. So. Yeah, hydrogen is part of everything. Exactly. I mean, anything that's got water in it or... Well, we're got, like 70% yeah. hydrogen yeah. sitting here. So. Yeah, so <laughs> just amazing stuff. And, yes. and you've run a couple safety classes out here. Can you tell us about the safety classes you've run for the fire department? Yeah. The fire? Yeah, so... As part of my projects, which we'll talk about later, I, you know, we wanted to get the first responders and the fire departments comfortable with hydrogen because, you know, when we go for permitting and, and all that, you need to have the first responders comfortable with this technology. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab has this great uh, uh, res uh, first responder training program. So we brought them out. Uh, we spent a week here on Oahu and then a week on the Big Island. Um, and we did about uh, two or 300 uh, first responders on each island. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have this test prop. It's a mock-up of a car. They have a hydrogen source inside the car, and they light it off and uh, so that the first responders can actually see what a hydrogen fire looks like <laughs> as opposed to a gasoline. They all know what a gasoline fire is. And so uh, that was very well received by the fire departments and the first responders. Because not only did it teach them about hydrogen, how to cope with a hydrogen fire, but it also gave them a lot of training that they didn't have on just electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, I mean, when you're using it in a car, it, it is an electric vehicle and you have these, you know, power cables that feed your electric motor and sometimes they have to cut through those with their... Um, yeah, their, their rescue equipment. Yeah, with the rescue equipment. So. That was something that they really appreciated as well. And then since then, um, we've had another round because we had a project with Young Brothers to have a uh, shore bait, well, actually it wasn't, it was, a, it was a fuel cell system in a shipping container that they used to power up their refrigeration units mm -hmm. on the barge. So as part of that, we wanted to refresh, have a refresher and, and hit people that hadn't had it before. So we had, you know, a uh, training sessions here on Oahu and then over on Maui, because the idea was that the shipping containers, you know, they're the, gonna use that route for the- They're gonna go to Maui yeah. and back. So that was very well done. And well, what are some of the things that the comments that the firefighters made that maybe surprised them about the hydrogen that, you know, they, because there's a lot of people that are scared to death of hydrogen. They've yeah. all kind of, they hear that it's it's invisible and everything and they freak out because you can't see it. Yeah. And But there's really, once you actually go through these demos, the firemen give you a response. What are some of the things they've said? Well. They got very comfortable with hydrogen very fast. So first of all, you hear the hydrogen flame. Even though you can't see it in sunlight, uh, you can sure hear it because it's coming out as a high pressure gas and it's almost deafening. Yeah, so it's really you know loud. you've got a leak and you know, and then you can see the ripples in the air from the heat of the fire. But the thing that impressed everybody the most is the guy giving the course, this very senior firefighter, had his bare hand and he was able to put it within about Three, inches. three inches or four inches of the flame front without even singeing his hand. And that's because hydrogen only produces water when it burns or when it's used, as opposed to It has no carbon in it. It has no carbon, and the carbon entraps heat. And that's why, you know, if that was a carbon-based fire, fossil fire, you'd burn your hand off. Because it would radiate the heat sideways. Exactly, so that was a huge deal. <laughs> and the other thing is the fact that hydrogen goes up so fast, you know, it goes up at 45 miles an hour, which is 90 feet per second. So if you say 1,001, you know, it's already gone up 60 to 90 feet, like it's like a six-story building. So it just naturally wants to get away, whereas gasoline is heavier than air, puddles around the, fi uh, the, the car. And spreads. And spreads and just sits there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people inside that car have a very, you know, um, it's very dangerous for them, but, but 
theoretically they could escape a hydrogen fire easily. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even singe the paint, right. basically, because it's going It's very directional, too. It's almost like yeah. a blowtorch. Yeah. And we brought uh, Paul Pontheo over. He works with uh, Hank Rogers. Mm -hmm. They have a great high, they've gone totally off grid on the big island and they have a lot of hydrogen uh, uh, systems that they use and, and he's uh, invented or built a little uh, hydrogen wok like a barbecue and so he brought that over and once again demonstrated some of these characteristics of hydrogen you know how it's very hard to light um, you know if it's if it's flowing up from uh, like a, a gas yeah. bottle mm -hmm. so that was really well received as well great yeah. yeah and then there's nothing to wash down if there's a if there's a gasoline fire, you know, oil fire, you got all this fuel spread on the ground. That you, you know, even if it's not burning, you got to soak it up, and it's environmentally hazardous and all kind of problems. Hydrogen, like you say, is going straight up in the air, making more clouds down the road, and yeah. you know, it's really really pretty benign. It is, and it's not it's not uh, um, poisonous gas. It's a Correct. totally inert. You can right. you can suffocate from it because you won't get any oxygen if you're yeah. in a pure hydrogen environment. But if you breathe a little bit of hydrogen, you're not going to have any ill effects from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not a carcinogen or any of that has none of those bad characteristics about it. Okay, well, you started working at HNEI. What are some of the different projects you worked on with HNEI? I know one of them was uh, like a pretty comprehensive plan for hydrogen back about 10 years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that plan and some yeah, of the other that, things? Yeah, that was um, part of the hydrogen fund that was uh, funded almost 10 years ago now, not quite. And part of the requirements was to build, uh, was to develop a hydrogen plan for the state of Hawaii. And so I was, uh, you know, detailed off or was given that assignment. Um, there were two plans. There were a three as a three year plan, like a short term plan, and then there was a ten year longer range plan. So we produced that, um, you know, ran it through uh, all the various different companies, got all sorts of feedback from General Motors and all the people that were doing hydrogen. And uh, you know, had graphs and and um, you know a strategy of how we could implement hydrogen here in Hawaii. And the main, some of the main findings that I like to maybe focus on is first of all, is to develop the hydrogen infrastructure. That is the key strategy because the cars and the buses, all the equipment that uses hydrogen, that'll be developed by industry. Like you see, every car company in the world now has a hydrogen program. Um, you know, the, bus, the the cars are here. We have seven Mirais sitting here in Honolulu waiting to be deployed. You know, you can buy, you can go out and lease a car in California with a hydrogen car with no problem. Yeah. But the issue is, where do you fuel them? And so that was part of it. Was okay. Let's focus on putting in the infrastructure because it doesn't an industry will only put that in when they see they can make money. And when you're first starting out, there's there are not enough cars, not enough trucks, or not enough buses to build up the volume of hydrogen like you would to have. To make it, it worthwhile. To make to, it worthwhile, yeah. they can't pay for it. Yeah. You know? So so government has to take the lead on that. They have to prime the pump, get it going, because it's the right thing to do for, you know, the general public to be able to have this capability. And the second one, second major strategy was to focus on fleets, fleet vehicles, and buses, because you'd only need one station to be able to fuel all 500 buses that the city of Honolulu has, as opposed to having to sprinkle hydrogen stations all over the islands. Um, and that is a, you know, that's a smart way to do it. Mm -hmm. So those are the two major findings, and we're working away at doing that. So well, Hawaii has some definite advantages uh, compared to like the mainland. I, I had uh, Margaret Larson on last week, and we talked a little bit about, you know, how much the state of California is investing in their hydrogen stations. I, uh, but they've got to, and and even when they finish with 100 hydrogen stations, well, they've covered California. But what if you want to go to Las Vegas or Denver? Exactly. Or, or, you know, Taos, New Mexico or something. I mean, you leave the state of California, where do you find your hydrogen? So the mainland has some serious challenges to get there and maybe not even a whole lot of incentive. A gas
gasoline's cheap, uh, natural gas is cheap. A lot of the big trucking right. companies are just going to uh, natural gas CNG for their trucks and uh, and saying that's cleaner. And so they, they don't want to stay there. But Hawaii's got a real advantage because we can do it all, can't we? Yeah, we have a constrained geography. I mean, you can't go too far on Hawaii. It's not like you can drive to Las Vegas from Hawaii. So uh, basically on Oahu, with three or four stations, you can cover the basics of, uh, Han of uh, Oahu to, to address first responders and, like I said, to take care of the buses. Um, uh, like a car, we'll get 325 to 350 miles on a tank of hydrogen. So you have to be really kind of dumb to run out of hydrogen driving around here. Okay. So that's why I say three or four stations could get the initial um, cover the initial fleets as they as they roll out. Okay. And on the Big Island, we calculated we need about five stations because the Big Island's bigger. So you have one north, one south, one east, one west, and maybe one sort of along the saddle road okay. or somewhere like that. But basically, yeah, you're not talking um, you know, hundreds of stations. Now, in, in uh, California, they're putting in 100 stations, and they're investing, the, the state is investing $20 million a year I think their maximum is will be $240 million to build out those 100 stations. Yeah, we're never going to get $240 million out of the state yeah. legislature here. So, Well, we come up on our first break, Karen. We're going to take a quick uh, 60 seconds to talk about some of the other shows on ThinkTech, and we'll be back with you in a minute. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Okay, we want to tell you about Hawaii, the state of clean energy, which plays every Wednesday from 4 to 4.30. Ray Starling and me, we co-host that show. Dean Nishina is here. He's from the Consumer Advocate. We just had a show. We liked the show. We had a good time on the show. What do you think, Ray? We're going to have Dean back because there's so much going on at the Consumer Advocate's office, and there's so much yet to be done to get to our 100% renewable energy goals. What do you think, Dean? Did you have a good time? I did have a good time, and I think this is a good opportunity for consumers to learn more because it, it'll be really helpful in terms of moving forward with our transition to clean energy. From your lips to God's ears. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Dean. Watch us, 4, 4 o'clock every Wednesday. You'll see. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here on my lunch hour with Mitch Ewan from the University of Hawaii's HNEI talking about hydrogen, my very, very, very favorite subject of all things. All things, because I'm old too. <laughs> anyway, Mitch, is, uh, we were talking a little bit about the plan for Hawaii and hydrogen. There's a lot going on on the Big Island too, and you're involved in a bunch of that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the projects over there? Yeah, I'd love to do that. So um, basically, um, just to backtrack a little bit, most, uh, most of the hydrogen activity here on Oahu is on federal land. And so it, it basically on military bases. You have your station at Hickam, I have mine at uh, Kaneohe Marine Corps Base. So the general public does not have easy access unless you get special permission to go there. On the Big Island, it's uh, totally different. We're installing a hydrogen infrastructure at the Natural Energy Laboratory Hawaii Authority, commonly called NELHA, which is on the west side, right beside the Kona Airport. It shares a boundary with the Kona Airport. And so what we're uh, installing there is we're installing a hydrogen production system comprised of an electrolyzer, which is used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen at the moment is vented off, but we could look at using the oxygen to support some of their aquaculture stuff they have sure. going on there. And, um, and then it goes from the electrolyzer, we have uh, three what I call hydrogen tube trailers. They are used to transport hydrogen from A to B so that we can deliver hydrogen to different spots on the Big Island. And we'll have one bus located at uh, Nelha, and that'll be operated by the Helion Bus the, Service. The county. The county, the county bus service. It's a 29 passenger shuttle bus, which was uh, converted from a brand new bus out of the out of the wrap, fresh out of the wrapper by US Hybrid, who is a company that has an operation here in uh, Oahu, which yep, right. co-located with you. Yep. They're awesome people to work with. 
um, and they converted that bus, and, and so the Helion will use it as a demo bus to allow the general public to see what's all this stuff about hydrogen. So they'll enjoy the quiet ride, the no fumes, um, and the acceleration, and all this kind of stuff. And so they'll actually get a chance to have an experience with a hydrogen vehicle. Neat. And then we have two additional buses also converted from brand new by US Hybrid that are, will be deployed at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And that's uh, been a project that's been going on for a long time with the park. And we are supplying the hydrogen for those buses using those tube trailers or the hydrogen transport trailers that I mentioned just, just a minute ago. And so we will haul those on by road up to Volcano National Park where we're installing a dispensing system, much simpler than the one I have at Nelha. And, um, and so we'll, we'll take a full trailer there, drop it off, the dispenser will dispense from the hydrogen trailer, and when the hydrogen trailer is empty, it'll be picked up and replaced with a full one. Okay. So um, those buses are slightly smaller, but they will be used to uh, transport visitors to the park, around the park on various routes that the National Park Service wants to test because they want to test how well these, uh, these fuel cell buses perform in the park. One additional bit is that we have uh, designed, invented, and we're patenting, patenting a uh, air filtration system because the park is great in many ways, but one of the things that has a lot of hydrogen sulfide or VOG that kicks out and that's not good for a fuel cell. So we designed the system and we've installed it. So basically it's a heads up display, tells the bus driver how well his filter's doing and at a certain point when it's maxed out and it's not filtering anymore, it'll cut off and a second filter will come in place and then he can get back and change the filter. Yeah, so he runs on battery for a little while possibly. Correct, and, it okay. can go through a plume and right. uh, get to the other side and then start up the fuel cell power system. Yeah, because like our bus, and I think the ones from Volcano are very similar to our Air Force bus, um, have about 20 kilowatt hours worth of battery storage and that's about 30 miles on level terrain. So. They could do quite a bit of driving just on battery if they have a real vloggy day correct, out there. Correct. I also want to mention that <clears throat> trying to use uh, the state's money wisely, we leveraged all the non-recurring engineering that went into designing the Air Force bus that you did, you developed at Hickam. So these buses, these follow-on buses, are replicas of that, and we don't have to repeat that oh. non-recurring engineering, which is was about seven hundred and fifty thousand yeah, dollars, which a is lot. a lot, a lot of money that we don't have to spend again. So that's a really good use of leveraging various uh, funds that we've got to do this project. Yeah, we're excited about seeing those things get out there. And we, I know that we talked a little bit before the show about um, about energy, grid energy, um, as a separate subject. But hydrogen has a role in, and could have a role in energy storage on the grid, couldn't it? Absolutely. In fact, the uh, w one of the rationales uh, for that hydrogen project at Nelha <clears throat> is to use the electrolyzer as a variable load, so it can ramp up and down and that will help uh, manage grid frequency, which changes as you have a disruption, either a big input of electricity or a quick draw of electricity. For example, if you have a wind turbine, it ramps up and down very quickly if there's gusty winds and that causes frequency to shift. And so what we use, we use the electrolyzer to absorb that. Either absorb it or desorb it so that you can keep the grid operating where, where it has to be. Which is what the electric company really needs. They really need that and they're becoming much more interested in hydrogen as energy storage and plus it has all these other benefits and also they can sell or somebody can sell the hydrogen as a fuel and transportation. So you got two or three ways of uh, providing uh, value out of this electrolyzer and hydrogen system and that will offset uh, the cost of your hydrogen. So here on Oahu uh, and in the state, we're trying to get to 100% renewable on the grid by 2045. And the neighbor islands can do that easy. I mean, right. they, they've got actually a, 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 a surplus of uh, renewable energy. But here on Oahu, not so much. So because hydrogen uh, is so transportable, is there a chance that we could use produce hydrogen on the neighbor island, specifically the big island, and then ship it in containers back to Honolulu? Is that unreasonable? That's that's technically totally feasible. Um, whether it's you know we have to look at the economics, 
but yes, it's totally feasible, and you and I have talked about other uh, ways to do that. You can bring it as a compressed gas, or you can liquefy it mm -hmm. and bring it over in, uh, in basically uh, like big thermos bottles. And they actually have a ship, I think, I forget the name of the uh, Japanese company, it's just built a hydrogen, liquid hydrogen ship to transport liquid hydrogen. So yeah, that's totally doable. And this technology, you know, it sounds like we're talking about rocket science technology. I mean, it is kind of rocket science because NASA has been shipping hydrogen from Canada to Cape Canaveral for probably 30 years because they use that in their rocket fuels. Yeah, they ship it actually from Louisiana okay. in a barge going along the intercoastal waterway. Okay. And that's how they get it. Yeah, and they ship like tons of the stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so like Federal Department of Transportation and the Coast Guard and shipping companies, they're very familiar with moving liquid hydrogen and compressed hydrogen. Correct, out. yeah, I mean, they have uh, three or four barges and yeah. they've been doing it like for 30 or 40 years. So yeah, there's a, you know, there's a history there that we can leverage at some point in time. Yeah. And I, for the life of me, can't remember the last time we had a hydrogen disaster in the modern container, modern shipping system. I mean, correct. I imagine there there may have been some out there, but you can't hardly go through a couple months without hearing about an oil leak or a, a, a you know a big a big fire or refinery uh, offshore drilling rig pipeline that leaks fires, or pipeline yeah. breaks or a, yeah. a, a Valdez or a something happening that you have big environmental impact and. You just don't have that with hydrogen. So. Well, let's put it this way. If your ship runs aground, your hydrogen ship runs aground, you're not going to have all our beaches covered in right. black oil. Yeah. So, okay. take advantage there. Well, what are some of the, has, has NOHA done, or HNEI done anything on, on the smaller islands on Molokai or Kauai, or done anything in ag or with uh, hydrogen? Or no, they? we actually haven't. Um, Part of the uh, push for our funding, I mean, the, the, the actual focus of legislation was to concentrate on the big island first. Got it. And then once we got that nailed down, then we could uh, take it to the other neighbor islands. I mean, okay. we have limited funds, and so you need to have that focus. As you know, right. being in the military, you know, it's like you got to focus your resources you on prioritize. one thing, and yeah. that's where our priority is. So once we have the buses up and running, and people see it and try it, and then, uh, then we can introduce the neighbor islands to that, and we can look at getting, you know, hydrogen, following the strategy, getting hydrogen buses on the neighbor islands. Mm -hmm. So we've seen hydrogen over the past 15, 20 years at least, kind of be in the fuel of the future and then it kind of dies off and then it comes back a little bit and then it dies off and yeah. I, I run into a lot of people that are very pessimistic about hydrogen not because they don't like the technology they're they're impressed with the technology but they go you know we've seen it before and it never seems to get anywhere is there something different this year I mean are you I'm noticing a, a different shift this year are you noticing yeah, that there's same a lot trend? of enthusiasm now for hydrogen um, you know, you see it with the automobile companies. They've invested billions. And so, like I said earlier in the show, it's like, you know, we have our local surf code Toyota dealership has a new Mirai, and uh, they're going to be leasing those vehicles for, like, under $400 a month. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the exact number is, but, you know, under 400 which includes the uh, cost of hydrogen. Right. So, I mean, that's totally, uh, you know, um, viable for many people here in this in our population. So, yeah, well, so it's, like, it's arrived. I'd like to thank you for your role in getting us there, because I know you've been on, this, on, on, the, on the watch longer than me with <laughs> hydrogen. So thanks yeah. for uh, mentoring me and helping me come up to speed on hydrogen. And uh, that's going to be a wrap for this week. We're already out of time, believe it or not. God, it goes by fast. Yeah, it goes by quick. So uh, thanks to Mitch Ewan from uh, h &E up at UH in Manoa for coming down and talking to us about hydrogen today. And we're bullish on hydrogen, so go out and buy your Mariah and your Clarity and your, uh, your Hyundai uh, uh, Tucson and get out there and drive with some hydrogen. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next week on Sam Energy.